Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled The Wild West Days of Skydiving. This is part three of my skydiving presentation, Forming the Iowa Parachute Team. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, I was unhappy with the previous uh, club out of Davenport, and this is a little uh, uh, paper um, newspaper article, and it talks about the Iowa Parachute Team. And I left the Davenport Club at the end of August, and I was able to have our first operation in March of 1971, the following year. Now, if you want to start a club, there are a lot of things. Well, one thing you need is people to jump. So we, uh, we actually made money by teaching a, a ground school, which helped to pay for certain expenses. We were a, uh, a non-profit, if you were, will. We weren't set up like that or anything like that. We just took the money in, used it for uh, expenses as necessary, and, and proceeded on. So um, we got started. We taught classes out at the university, uh, tried to become a university-sanctioned club. And um, first thing to do was to get an airplane. Well, I was in electrical engineering school, and Kent uh, Gillingham, who um, unfortunately passed away in uh, the crash of a 401, I believe. He was uh, into leasing aircraft, and this occurred wa uh, later while I was in the Air Force. But at the time, he and I were both in electrical engineering. Now, he had a, a degree as a doctor. He's a little bit older. He had a degree as a doctor, and he's going back to get an engineering degree because he was going to be involved with relating uh, the two fields. But he had a, uh, a Cessna 180, which is a great jump airplane. And uh, Kent was an interesting guy, uh, very intelligent. He was about seven feet tall. When he come into the classrooms, he had to duck to get in. But um, I persuaded uh, Kent to let us uh, lease his airplane, and he agreed. Okay, well, some things you have to do if you want to have a jump plane. Well, you, you need a step. The, the students should really not have to step out onto the wheel and hope that the, uh, the uh, pilot remembered to tighten up the brakes. You want a, a step they can step out on. Well, I wasn't a pilot at the time, and I didn't really know much about aviation other than jumping out of airplanes and using parachutes. I didn't know what an SDC was, a uh, special type certificate. I didn't know what a 337 was, weight and balance. I went to a friend of mine, engineering. Uh, actually, he later came out and skydived with us. I kind of had a bad influence on him. But I said, hey, I need a six-foot piece of steel pipe. And it was, a, it was a lot thicker than this. This thing was heavy. So he cuts me off a six-foot piece of steel pipe. And the Cessna 180 has uh, the little yellower, though. It has these two nice little steps that come down that you're supposed to put your foot on to get in. Well, boy, you take this uh, uh, pipe there, you use a couple of U-clamps, uh, not aviation-grade U-clamps or anything. These came from, I think, True Value. And you bolt that thing on, and I put a little uh, bit of non-stick tape on that, and we had a step. Uh, when this thing went in for the first annual, the mechanic goes, what is that? And I said, oh, that's our step. And he goes, you have the paperwork for that? You have the SDC? You got 337? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he says, okay, I don't want to see that in here again. I said, I don't care what you do with it after you get done with the annual, but I don't want to see, that's not going to get signed off. I don't want to see that. So I quickly took it off, and of course we put it back on later. Didn't realize all of this was highly illegal and uh, inappropriate and probably even fattening. Who knows? So... I uh, grew up in Iowa City, Iowa. There's the Iowa City Airport. It's a very historic airport. It was on, you know, uh, cross-country mail routes and stuff like that. And E.K. Jones was the FBO, fixed base operator, and the airport manager. He had both titles. And we were going to operate off of the uh, airport there. And, and what I had done was I had found a... Uh, I, I went to the Geological Society in town at the university, got a, um, a topographical map... And I found a, uh, a place that looked flat enough and convinced the farmer to let us uh, jump onto that. That was going to be our drop zone. Okay, it was seven miles or so. Uh, not as bad as Davenport, but not ideal. We didn't have the, uh, the little strip on, on the field at the time, but, but that's, uh, that's about to happen. So here's my logbook. There's the first entry in 20 March 1971. Again, Iowa, March. Well, it's warming up, but it was still, it was still pretty cold. In fact, um, this was a pasture land we jumped onto, and either side were uh, plowed fields that were muddy. 
I was the one who landed, happened to land. We had some pretty strong winds that day, unfortunately. I landed on the field. The other two jumpers, one landed short, one landed long, and they ended up being full of mud. But what I did, the, uh, the red arrow there is Iowa City Airport, and the yellow arrow there is the farmer who I convinced, well, it took some... Um, uh, apricot schnapps on a regular basis, but I convinced him to let us use uh, some land he had that was uh, set back. It was not to be uh, uh, cultivated at the time, and so it was just a little uh, pasture, and I talked him into letting us use it. So uh, there's there's his uh, his farm there, and um, the uh, that's with with the uh, the blue arrow there, and the green arrow is. Um, that's kind of the pasture land. It was actually bigger than that, but that was the part we kind of designated as our runway. So, okay, we uh, we ended up having a runway, and uh, E.K. Jones did not like us operating out of uh, the Iowa City Airport. He went to the city council. Uh, I went there, too, to argue my case, but he was making money, didn't like us interfering. Uh, he had the whole area he felt was for his students. He didn't want uh, jumpers anywhere near it, and uh, the city council said, nope, can't do it. So, Okay, no good. So, fine, I got this. Uh, he wasn't excited about this either because uh, it was like seven miles from the airport. That was still too close as far as he was concerned, but I had this uh, field. Uh, Phobian was the farmer's name. Uh, real real character, nice guy. But uh, uh, So we had the field. We had our drop zone out there, and we operated off this uh, essentially grass strip. And of course, the other thing I did was, uh, you know, we had to have fuel and uh, oil. So I uh, contacted the local distributor and I got a good deal on, um, this was uh, 80 octane fuel, which you don't can't even get anymore. It, it's what the, uh, the 180 ran off of, the lower octane fuel. But I got a deal for the 80 octane fuel and uh, he would actually deliver it to our tank on the, uh, the strip there. Um, and the farmer actually had this extra 600 gallon tank and pump that he, uh, let us, uh, use. And that's how we fueled the aircraft. E.K. Jones was not excited because we weren't buying fuel from him, even though he didn't want our operation and he tried to shut us down, but it was a different distributor than his. So that was just too bad. Yeah. I made a lot of friends early on. I'll tell you that. So. Here is uh, our jump plane, and that was one of uh, our two jump masters. We had Charlie Fryermuth and we had Dickerson here. And uh, that picture that picture had one of our female students. Now here is in, in the press release there, and it talks about uh, 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 James Dickerson, uh, who was the uh, jump master. He was a junior, and... Uh, Let's see, it says, what was I there? I was, uh, should have been a, uh, a, a, a sophomore there. And uh, um, we had six female students, and this is one of the six, and uh, he's getting ready to, um, you know, get her all outfitted there and, and to go jumping. Now, these are some of the pictures that appeared in the paper um, and this was a good source of publicity, of course, to help us get new students. And, uh, we had some pretty good spreads there and the pictures of a guy, uh, packing a chute. There's the uh, chute being laid out. Some people have just landed, stuff like that. And it, it, it helped us with a, uh, continual, uh, supply of, uh, students, which, uh, which is very good to grow the club. We ended up with a problem. Uh, and okay, these are males college students, you know, uh, the altimeter that you had to read to see what altitude you were at was on the reserve. And some of the female students had an issue with seeing the altimeter. And of course, a lot of the guys came over, they tried to offer suggestions, they tried to look, yeah, yeah, you really have trouble seeing that and stuff like that. And I said, okay, guys, cut it out. And uh, I lent her my wrist altimeter, an altimeter you strap with Velcro on uh, your wrist, and uh, then you can read it. Oh, by the way, look at that young geeky guy. And that's my uh, wife um, at the time, still is 52 years later. She, she just put up with all my stuff. But uh, that's my wife there. And she wrote the um, thank you notes out on the drop zone while she kept the, uh, the books out there. 
And this is relative work where you come together, you form these formations. Uh, we kind of taught ourselves that because, uh, we, well, we had the two jump masters, but uh, it was it was kind of learned by doing, and that was that was quite a that was quite a fun experience. We we really uh, taught ourselves how to do relative work. This this was back in the the early days of skydiving, and there weren't at the time a lot of people who even did skydiving. And of course, we'd have a few visiting jumpers. This guy was a dentist. He, it, it's backwards there, but he has sharks because you're supposed to read it from the other side. That was his name. He's got it on his paracommander. And I and two other guys held the altitude record. Uh, we went out at 14,200 feet. We didn't know about oxygen. We were getting a little giddy. The deal was we went east for a while to get some altitude coming back. We had strong winds, and we just kept climbing to get to the drop zone. We were supposed to go out at 10,000 feet, and we just kept climbing. We got 14,200, and away we went. Well, of all things, we kept this airplane out on this field, uh, this farmer's field. We had we had it tied down with ropes. Well, Iowa can get some pretty nasty weather conditions, and um, you know I'd never leave my airplane in a situation like this. Uh, and uh, it was it was there over the winter. And you saw the red arrow there. The uh, one of the ropes came undone. It uh, pushed the airplane over and bent the wing tip. Well. I don't know if they've got an STC or something, or, you know, a, a, a ferry permit to get it out of there. But anyway, I pilot flew it out of there, flew it back to uh, the main Iowa City airport and uh, uh, got the uh, the airplane fixed. Well, I went off to Air Force summer camp. I came back and uh, um, that was pretty much my end of skydiving because I was going into the Air Force and I was going into flight training. So... Uh, I left the club in very good hands. They um, uh, stopped using uh, Phobian's field. I don't know quite why. I, I, th I think he actually uh, started using it as a uh, farm field again. And they found another farmer and they used his field for a while. And then they actually went back to Marion, Iowa uh, to jump. They, they moved it back there because uh, they couldn't find any farmers who would let them use it. So here they got they got a jump plane, and this is Marion, Iowa. I went back there in my Great Lakes biplane recently, and uh, you see all this open space there? It was the runway and a lot of open space and a barn. Okay, here's uh, coming in on final Marion recently. Uh, they've got hangars. They had no hangars uh, at the time. They've got um, a nice little uh, fixed space facility. See, this is what we had. We had the uh, we had the barn where we kind of used it to pack our parachutes. That was kind of our, uh, you know, what we did. And that was, you know, it's the old cars there. And there's the jump plane. And uh, we were out in the grass uh, packing chutes. There's the jump pilot. Uh, I don't know what happened to Joe. I, I came back there to visit uh, briefly. And uh, I, met, I met the new pilot. He's got a little cane there. So, um, you know, uh, I guess he had a leg problem. That was kind of funny thing. These guys are out there packing their chutes and um, closing the chute pack when you get the, the chute all packed up and you get the sleeve on. Um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a technique to doing it. And I'm kind of standing there uh, with my wife and watching these two guys, uh, quite athletic and muscular guys with their girlfriends, and they're trying to close the pack. Well, there's, there's a definite technique. And you can't just manhandle it. And they're trying to close it. you got to bring the pack together. And they had the pins and the cones, the metal pins, the metal cones, which are considered really dangerous uh, now. But, um, you know, I had an a aerobatic student, not to digress here, but an aerobatic student that I told him about the shoot I had. And he said, oh, those things are dangerous. They killed people. And I go, well, you know, I'm still here. Uh, but, yeah, they were dangerous. But, anyway, these guys are trying to close. The one guy tries to close it. He can't close it. The other guy tries to close it. He can't close it. And you remember that early picture that scrawny guy in there next to that really cute little uh woman there uh but anyway um i say well can i give it a try and the guy looks at me and they both laugh um because you know if they didn't have the strength to do it why did they think i did so i go there and i, I push the pack under and i bring the part up and i bring it over here and i go blup 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 with the pins and the guy says you've done that before and I go, yes, I have. There's a technique. And I popped the chute and I said, let me show it. So I showed him and they were all grateful. And the, the macho guy kind of went away. And uh, even the strani guy could show him something. So here's the modern facility. The barn's gone. They've got this nice, typical FBO. 
And this is not, well, actually it is. Uh, the skydiving facilities nowadays are pretty impressive commercial operations and they run caravans and, and they run quite an operation. The one we have in Illinois over at um, the local airport is quite an operation and, and very professional. It wasn't kind of like like our thing. But anyway, uh, I know I've gone a little bit long. Sorry about this. This is kind of a big episode of the Iowa Parachute team, but that was the team I started. It it existed for a few years. I don't know quite when it went under because I was off gone long into the Air Force and stuff like that. And I really, uh, I lost contact with people. That's the sad part. And I really don't know what happened. But anyway, that's that story, part three. And the next part I'm going to tell you about um, Jake when he came back to jump at my club. Uh, the Iowa Parachute Team, and also about a student that, through my negligence, um, uh, almost killed. And uh, it's uh, it's not a good story, not one I'm proud of, but uh, it's, it's a story worth repeating. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for part four. Thanks for watching.